Hi, good evening uh, and welcome to this evening's webinar. Uh, I'm Stuart Hogg, National Sales Manager at Osser uh, here in the UK. Uh, welcome to tonight, Brace Before Replace on Conservative Management of OE. Uh, this is our ninth webinar in our KOL series, uh, this time coming live from our Manchester office. Uh, over the past eight weeks, we've run the webinars from uh, my colleague Giles' house, uh, which really limited to what we were able to do uh, and present to you. Uh, but now with many much, uh, much more space and kit, we can hopefully bring you a more immersive experience. Uh, so with that in mind, just want to kind of go through some of the camera angles that we're able to do now uh, within, uh, within the office. Uh, first of all, we have table cam, uh, which we'll move over. You may see a familiar face there, um, Giles leaving. Um, so here we're able to go through product um, at, at close quarters, um, and Giles will be able to go through unboxing and the product itself. Um, we'll also, uh, at the end of the evening, go through a, a fitting um, at, at safe social distance um, from the front on camera. You see uh, Giles there, uh, and also a side view camera as well, uh, which is a dynamic cam, so we can able to, to walk through um, the brace as well. Um, so we have four um, camera angles that we can work from, making it uh, a bit more dynamic. Um, but we're very uh, lucky this evening uh, to be joined by Amit Chandratria. Uh, if Amit can say hello. Good evening, Amit. Thank you for joining us. No problems. Uh, Mr. Amit Chandratria is a consultant trauma and orthopaedic surgeon working at the Princess of Wales Hospital uh, in South Wales uh, in Bridge End since 2006. He's a double fellowship trained surgeon, undertaking the Isikos and Basque recognised fellowships. He provides a comprehensive knee service from sports injuries around the knee through to the management of arthritic conditions, including complex knee procedures, osteotomies, cartilage repair, and meniscal transplantation. He's an honorary clinical teacher for Cardiff University Medical School. He's a member of BOA, Basque, Isikos, BKS, BIOS, WOC, and IOA. Uh, he is on the executive panel for the British Indian Orthopaedic Society and is a regional clinical coordinator for the NGR and is the SSI lead for his hospital. He is passionate about teaching and training and was voted the trainer of the year in 2019 by the Welsh trainees. So tonight, Mr. Chandra Trail will discuss the non-operative management of unicompartmental arthritis of the knee. He was one of the co-authors of the BMJ paper to analyse the economic benefits of the unloader brace and was part of the steering group set up to formulate a pathway for OA of the knee. Um, so quite relevant to, to the situation at the moment. Um, we're also lucky uh, tonight to be joined by an unloader user. Um, if I can introduce Stacey. Stacey, can you can say hi? Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Sporting our, uh, our awesome t-shirt there. Um, so Stacey has represented her country in both football and boxing. In 2018, she made history when she became the first ever British woman to win the Commonwealth title. As a footballer, she represented England at under 18s, played in an FA Cup final, and has also played abroad in America and Sweden. As an amateur boxer, Stacey won a European silver medal and has now turned professional, winning the Commonwealth title in 2018. Uh, Stacey is currently enjoying presenting the Dead Good Show on Radio Manchester, if you want to tune in, uh, and is currently training uh, for her upcoming fight. Um, so before we pass over to Amit, uh, just a couple of uh, housekeeping rules as we, uh, as we normally do. Um, so if you've used the webinars before or a Zoom format, you'll be familiar with the Q&A function. Uh, so please feel free to use that throughout the session, asking Amit or Stacey any questions. Uh, Giles will be manning that, so you'll be able to, uh, to ask those questions as the evening goes on. Uh, there's also a chat function. Um, this evening's webinar will be recorded uh, and put on the Officer Academy YouTube channel, um, usually by the end of the week, around about Friday. Uh, you'll also be sent out an e-certificate for attending. Do check your junk mail inbox, as some people find they go in there, uh, and just save it as a PDF. Um, but we'll also be sending you out some follow-up questionnaires, so please do fill them in if you can give us some feedback about how we can make these webinars a bit better. Uh, hopefully we're, we're taking things to a slightly different level uh, with this evening. Um, so with that in mind, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, enjoy the evening. Uh, please do be interactive as possible, asking questions through the Q&A function. Uh, and at this point, I'll, uh, I'll pass over to Amit. I hope you enjoy. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you for those kind words. Uh, I think there's a poll which uh, Giles is going to start off initially to find out uh, how many participants uh, we have currently. So if you could start off with the poll. There we go. Yep. Yeah, so just so, 
So it's just, uh, just asking what is your role um, and uh, it just helps uh, for, for Mr. Chandratreya just to, just to know uh, who's, who's, who's uh, in the audience and it just means that we can uh, adjust it accordingly. Um, so we're nearly at uh, 70%. Um, I'll just keep it up for, for another few seconds um, and then I think we've, we've got everyone. So that's pretty good. So I'm just going to share those results here. So you can see that there's 2% consultants, 3% uh, trainee or specialist doctors, 55% physios, 20% orthotists, 4% OTs, 2% uh, sports therapists, and 15% other. Uh, that's quite a good spectrum uh, in the audience. So good evening, everyone who's attending. Uh, hope you're safe wherever you are. It was quite sunny about an hour ago. It's now really pouring down in South Wales. Hope you've got a nice glass of wine or tea and coffee mug in your hands. So I was asked uh, to talk about uh, brace before replace as management of unicompartmental osteoarthritis non-operative management. However, in view of the current COVID pandemic, uh, it could be brace or replace that we do not perform any arthroplasties uh, in the near future and brace these patients to give them pain relief. Uh, this is a non-operative management talk and hopefully we should be able to answer some of your questions which we'll put ahead. Uh, start off thanks to Osser Academy for asking me to do this webinar. Uh, our nurses in the fracture clinics who for the past 13 years have worked tirelessly to maintain registers, get in touch with patients, uh, with help from the Osser colleagues locally. And uh, Paul Lee who, was, uh, who started off the initial discussion about the paper which went on to publication and the co-authors in that paper. So thank you to those. There's no conflict of interest for this and all patients have given written permission uh, for the pictures and videos to be shown. So what we're going to talk today is unicompartmental osteoarthritis of the knee, the management pathways, specifically non-operative and conservative management, our experience at the GEND, and then we'll follow with some case examples of how these patients uh, are being treated. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, I'm happy to be stopped in between. I can answer those, so that's not a problem. Uh, most of the evidence is out there uh, on the net, so I won't be giving you loads of papers uh, to read through tonight. Some of the papers link will be posted to you uh, at the time when the webinar is completed. So what are we talking about? We are talking about end stage arthritis, which is shown on the picture on your left, which shows a bare bone both on the tibia and the femur and the degenerative medial meniscus. This is the end stage arthritis, which currently the treatment would be a partial or a total knee replacement. The picture in the middle shows you a medial osteoarthritis and the picture on your right shows a lateral osteoarthritis when the femur is touching the tibia in this angle leading to symptoms which are mainly pain, swelling, blocking and giving way. Some patients will also get some instability because the joint has now become incongruent and they will have difficulty walking on uneven steps, going up and down stairs and sitting prolonged periods in one position. So this is what we are treating. We are not going to discuss tricompartmental OA or patellofemoral OA. This is basically unicompartmental OA, medial or lateral. Why do people get osteoarthritis? Uh, this is, uh, I apologize for this basis, but I think it's important to know with this Olympic ring style diagram that aging genetics have a major role to play in osteoarthritis. Uh, injury at a younger age can lead to loss of meniscus, loss of articular cartilage leading to arthritis. Patients are maybe born with some malalignment issues or develop malalignment due to injury. And then this can lead to unicompartmental OA. Combined with this, you get weight problems. Uh, people may still want to carry on snowboarding, skiing, et cetera, and cause further injury to the knees. And this causes further osteoarthritis. Unfortunately, with the domino effect of osteoarthritis, uh, starting from the bottom, which is just an inconvenience initially, this loss of activity, lack of exercises, weight gain, going to other issues like uh, complications from taking your uh, medications for quite a long time, obesity and medical comorbidities. So it's a, quite a wide spectrum of osteoarthritis. It is just not uh, a reduction of joint space on an x-ray, but uh, a whole, whole treatment for the patient. 
if you look at holistic treatment uh, uh, for these patients, we usually start with patient education, which is very important. Uh, simple analgesia, paracetamol, lifestyle changes, which is difficult for some patients to accept because for years they've been doing a particular task and they want to carry on doing that, whether it be manual labor or sports activities. Then going on to opo opioids or stronger analgesia, braces, walking aids, trekking poles, all these help to manage your pain. These are all help with injection therapies, which could be from plain steroids to local anesthetics, uh, PRP, ACP, hyaluronic acid injections, uh, BMAC. Uh, so these can be helped, but are not the first mainstay of treatment. Failure of all this in un unicompartmental osteoarthritis leads to osteotomy or arthroplasty. And that is what we're trying to avoid by bracing. You need adequate imaging when uh, physios and doctors see these patients in the clinic. Uh, this patient uh, has a standard AP view, which you see on your left-hand side. But unless you do a skiing or a Rosenberg view, you do not see the damage that is actually there when there is complete joint space loss and you can understand why that patient has got that symptoms. MRI obviously will be helpful in looking at meniscal tears and fondal damage. But in this case, lateral OA, a skiing view is extremely important. Similar in this case of medial OA, these are x-rays taken on the same day, same patient, a standing AP on your left-hand side and a skiing view shows complete joint space loss. So then you can understand why that patient has that symptoms. And I think it's essential as part of your routine x-ray series to do skiing and skyline views. Uh, I'm a surgeon, so most patients will come to me for surgical solutions. So here you have a patient who's got medial unicompartmental osteoarthritis, and we have tried all the non-operative treatment that we can give. Uh, if they now want to come to some sort of a surgical uh, procedure, for a younger age group, we will consider an osteotomy. Uh, we measure the angles of the distal femur and the proximal tibia and determine where the deformity is and correct it accordingly. In this case, we have done a high tibial osteotomy along with a uh, meniscal uh, transplant here, like a biological replacement for the younger uh, patient groups. Uh, for elderly patient groups, I won't mention which are elderly, but patients who have got severe symptoms we could consider a partial knee replacement uh, in which we replace part of the joint with metal and plastic. These currently have a lifespan of up to 10 to 12 years, provided you look, look after them, uh, but they will lead on to needing a total knee replacement at some stage. Some surgeons will go on to do a total knee replacement, uh, even for a medial or unicompartmental OA. And this is also an accepted regime, but is a bigger operation, as you can see from the pictures. So these are the solutions which we can offer for unicompartmental OA. However, arthroplasty doesn't always work well. Infection uh, is the dreaded complication, uh, can lead to a most drastic amputation if not controlled. We can have periprosthetic fractures of the tibia, uh, periprosthetic fractures of the distal femur, and some of these may go on to revision. So the cost and complications of joint replacement have to be considered when you're discussing management with the patient. We know from evidence up to 25% of patients are unhappy uh, following a knee replacement and the cost of revision is quite high. Following the Montgomery ruling, material risks have to be informed to the patient. So if there is a non-operative uh, treatment available, you have to inform that to the patients. Some of you may be familiar with this consentplus.com, which was developed at the gen. Uh, and it's free to use for you and your patients to understand the risks and benefits of arthroplasty. So we now know that not all patients with an arthroplasty do well. So can we offer bracing for unicompartmental OA? And this offers a non-pharmacological, non-invasive treatment option. We know from various studies that it, the symptoms of knee OA will reduce. And once the symptoms reduce, patients can go back to a little active lifestyle and to maintain the general physical health, which is what is needed. This can be a part uh, of the prehab for patients waiting for a knee replacement to get their health better. So the outcome of a knee replacement is better than without doing any prehab. Uh, this is old clinical guideline from NICE uh, 2014, but the bottom line, the NICE did advocate that patients with osteoarthritis who have 
biomechanical joint line problems or instability should be considered for bracing or for joint supports. So this was in 2014 when uh, NICE recommended using of brace. So we were the first hospital in the UK to use the unloader one brace uh, and we started using unloader brace since 2006. Uh, we're very fortunate to start a nurse-led brace clinic at Vigent and over the years these nurses have you know, carried on looking after these patients, uh, keeping registers, follow-ups, etc. So our experience at Vigent so far has been up almost 500 braces we have used over this 13 year period. It's not in one year. Uh, and our experience led to decide whether we can do a study to look at these braces. A poll is now coming up just to make sure you're all awake and listening to my talk. So if Giles can start up the poll there. Okay, um, so Mr. Chantre just wanted to know about your experience of using braces. So uh, have you heard of Unloader 1 brace before? Uh, and the second question is, do you use Unloader uh, 1 for your patient caseload? Um, so we've had about 40% of the people uh, respond. It's, it's actually two questions the way that this one is set up. Um, so I'll leave it up for a little while longer. Um, and I will just stop it there because we're over, we're actually at 80% there. So if I share that, so 84% have heard of it uh, before um, and 63% uh, are actually using it in their current patient caseload. Excellent, thank you. So those 63% now can switch off the webinar and go and have a drink because they're using it already. But for the others who are there, we'll carry on with our uh, presentation. So uh, Paulie came up with this idea of looking at the cost effectiveness of using the unloader brace at Bridgend. Uh, so this is the typical patient. Uh, There's a female patient, 54 years old, wants to carry on playing golf. Oxford knee score is low. Uh, she's got lateral OA, uh, doesn't want to consider an arthroplasty at the current moment. Or a patient like this, who is 45, who is a heavy manual worker, works in a factory. He's got a medial menstrual deficiency along with an ACL deficiency. He cannot take time off work, cannot, uh, you know, one year rehab almost of an osteotomy. Uh, or a knee replacement at this young age. So these are the patients we consider whether bracing will be effective. So in our study, we looked at 63 patients who were fitted with the brace between 2007 and 2009. These patients were actually listed for either a partial or a total knee replacement. And at that time, which is again, the time coming up to now, there were longer waiting lists for patients coming up to surgery. So we started whether we could give it as an interim measure to give the brace for these patients. EQ5D scores were filled up uh, and again at eight years. And these patients were followed up whether any surgical intervention had occurred in the interim. So the findings were quite interesting. Uh, as usual, expect more of a medial uh, uh, compartment issues and more male patients. Uh, the mean age was 42, which explains why this brace is important in young adults who have osteoarthritic changes in the knee. So we found that almost 33% of patients did not require surgery at eight years follow-up. Interestingly, gender, BMI, age, compartment, or the side of the leg did not affect the chance of success. The length of wear, that is how long the patient wore the brace, was an important factor to determine success. And we were able to uh, conclude that if the patients wore a brace for two years, they did not have any surgery, either an osteotomy, partially or a total knee for eight years. Almost all of them were able to return back to the daily activities and we definitely showed that there was a cost effectiveness along with patient's quality of life. So the offloading brace definitely delayed surgery and in some patients who still carried on using the brace. Uh, in 2018, then uh, Dr. Dylan Mystery looked uh, at the update on unloading knee braces for a 10 year review from 2008 to 2018. And he found 112 papers out of which 15 or 16 papers were relevant uh, regarding whether the unloader brace actually works. And it was found that the use of unloader braces was increasing. He found only three RCTs in that 10 year period and it is difficult to run RCT in these patients. However, this recent uh, paper in osteoarthritis and cartilage from Netherlands 
They compared high tubal osteotomy with an unloaded brace. They concluded that the high tubal osteotomy gave better pain relief at the end. However, on comparison the data, the benefit ratio uh, led them to believe whether high tubal osteotomy with their complications is actually better than no complications with the brace. The complications of the brace were the skin rashes and uh, poor fitting, but no major complications. Mohit Bandari's group looked at a scoping review in 2016, and the unloader brace from Osser was the I think, only brace looked at, which has got two level one studies. Uh, most of them were level three and four. So Osser unloader brace is the brace which has been maximally studied and researched uh, so far. So we are offering a non-surgical pathway for unicompartmental osteoarthritis. We know from our own study and other studies that we can offer up to 50% of pain relief if it is the right patient with the right indication. There's almost 80% increase in their activity post brace application leading to increased confidence. It's a non-invasive procedure, burns no bridges. You can have a long-term use uh, up to eight or nine years in some of our patients and it's a biomechanical solution. I won't go into the details of how the brace works. It's all up on the OSER website uh, and uh, Giles will go through regarding the unloader X anyway. But it, it does work by acting like a seat belt and prevents uh, the, uh, and does the unloading on the medial or the lateral side. We had also done some gait studies and there's enough evidence that the brace changes the knee adduction moment. And therefore, gait improves and increases the confidence of the patient. So the brace actually helps uh, in doing this as well. You need to have a motivated and symptomatic patient. If you show a brace to the patients and they start crying in front of you, the brace is not for them because they need to wear it while walking uh, almost all the time uh, for the first few weeks and then as and when required afterwards. Fitting can be an issue if they have got lumps and bumps on the knee or their previous scars. Uh, so this brace is uh, expensive, so uh, it's only prescribed if the patient is motivated and the surgical team and the nurses feel that the patient is going to wear it. So our indications currently is grade three or four, telegrin lorenz osteoarthritic changes on the radiographs with some malalignment. And this malalignment, as you've just seen on the video, should be at least partially correctable, otherwise the brace doesn't work that well. Mr. Chandra could I just pop in with a quick question from yes. Anushika? Um, yes. Just asking, is there a tendency to, to affect the good side um, uh, when you're, you're using, a using a brace, just because obviously there will be a, a change in the loading in your knee? Do you have any experience uh, along those lines? So this is the asymptomatic knee. Is that the question, if I understand? Um, yes, I mean, I think it's more talking if you have a medial knee and we're thinking of the lateral uh, compartment. Have you noticed no, any, any no. problems with the opposite yeah. side? No, so the amount of uh, unloading it does, does not increase that. In fact, we have some x-rays we're showing with, the, with and without the brace that there is marginal opening of the medial joint line. So it does not affect, it does not push the weight bearing line to the other compartment. So the other compartment does not get affected. Okay, that's great, thanks. Um, and so we're just on to the, the third poll now. So I'm just going to get this up. Um, and Mr. Chandra was just wondering, are you able to prescribe a load of braces at your clinic? So how available are these types of interventions for you? The reason for this question is lot, not a lot of trust allowed braces to be used and lots of you know, primary care centers will not allow this to be used. So we are up to uh, about 70% now. I'll we'll just leave it up for a little while longer. Um, and I'll just end it there. We're just at about 75%. Uh, so 60% um, uh, are able to use it at their clinics, 21% uh, aren't, uh, and then 19% don't know. So I'll just share that briefly with you. Okay, that's, there we go. that's good to know. Right, so that's what we know. Uh, for the physios in the audience, the rehab is continued during bracing. That has to be done. You have to carry on with your strengthening, your cardio, and of course the weight loss, which goes along with that. Uh, I'm grateful for John McIntyre for giving me these slides, couple of slides. What exercise is best? 
and yours is the one that gets done and it's simple and appropriate for that patient uh, and that's very important. Uh, he did send me this slide of load management which I don't understand much but I'm, I'm sure a lot of you do that but this is important to manage the load which goes uh, through the knee and to manage how you're going to treat this patient. So going forwards, uh, patient compliance is one thing which has been discussed in a lot of uh, papers that once a brace is fitted, there's very poor compliance and after three or four weeks, patient doesn't use this. Uh, for this, we started the nurse-led clinic. So there's a direct communication between the nurses and the patient. Uh, we maintain registers. We've come up with brace ordering forms, looking at Oxford knee scores and pain scores prior event before the brace is fitted. Uh, at the time of the brace fitting, lots of questions are asked whether it's helpful for the patients. Uh, we might have to add some psychological questions in here because it is a visual thing to put on your knee and especially if you want to go out walking. A brace check is extremely important at six weeks and afterwards as well to make sure that the brace is fitting, they're not over tightening or not tightening. And these things have helped us to increase the patient compliance to use uh, the braces. Quick run through the case examples. Uh, 68 males has got a various deformity. You say, right, he needs a knee replacement. Yes, but he doesn't want one. He says, can you manage with something else? So he's been now a brace user for four years. Uh, he can go for long walks. He's staying active. It takes one aprox in a day, nothing more than that. And he's able to carry on. He will need a knee replacement. His varus is mildly correctable, but he's happy with his brace. I don't think age is a barrier for uh, brace treatment. Uh, some patients have been fitted, uh, as you can see in this patient here. This is a young patient, 37, who had a medial meniscectomy 10 or 12 years ago, is now drifting into varus. Uh, he's got a medial muscle extrusion and chondral changes. Yes, he is being offered an osteotomy, uh, but he can't take time off work. You know, these are the real world problems. He can't take time off work, he's in symptoms. So Brace has been fitted three years now and is carried on working. The virus has not deteriorated and we are keeping a close eye on that. Uh, <laughs> this patient uh, does everything, snowboarding, running, everything. You can see she stressed the brace completely. And I think we have put her in the third brace or something by now. She has grade four lateral changes in her right knee, but she cannot do, do without the brace. Uh, she's looking after family and etc. Another example, 42 years old male. Uh, is You can see he's in a significant varus of his right knee. He needs an osteotomy and he needs a postulateral uh, protection by doing the osteotomy. However, he has just changed his job. He cannot take time off work. Osteotomy means at least up to a year, if not more, to recovery. So he has been fitted with a brace three years now and he's managing. We're keeping an eye to make sure the virus doesn't increase. He will obviously need an osteotomy at some stage. Here's of Anthony Hayes, 59 years old gentleman. How long have you had the brace for, sir? Roughly six weeks. How much was the pain before the brace? Nine. And now? Two, three. Two, three. Can you stand up for me, please? And can you do all your activities with it? Yeah, yeah. So you can see from the x-ray, this is, you know, grade four osteoarthritis, lateral compartment, heavy manual worker, but he's now back to work and do his activities. Yes, he can be offered an arthroplasty, but if he can treat it non-operatively, maybe better for him initially. Unloader moment is when we fitted the brace and patients who come walking with crutches go out without crutches. A lot of these case stories are on the OSER website and we have four or five a year of these unloader moment patients who suddenly feel that their life has changed uh, following fitting of the brace. When you look at non-invasive treatment, we then set up a steering group meeting uh, with surgeons, uh, physios, rehab conditioning specialists, GPs, private healthcare, insurers, patient rep Sharon Davis, we had a lot of meeting in uh, 2018 uh, and we are setting out a pathway to treat this. Following one of this meeting and possibly as a consequence of this, AXA have now uh, agreed that they, it's an approved brace, if you can see the bottom line for osteoarthritis. And very important, they say it's a pre-replacement alternative treatment. They do not say it's a replacement alternative. So it can be used before a patient is offered surgery. Just a quick a few words on other uses of unloader brace. We have found it useful in SONC, not in every case, but it helps patients remain some touch weight bearing. 
Uh, this is a 48 years old female with sudden increase in pain in the knee. MRI has shown not a root tear, but a posterior horn tear with meniscal extrusion and some chondral changes already. We know this is doomed for osteoarthritis within three or four years. However, we fitted with a brace. Uh, pain score has dropped. She is now able to do her activities and she tells us it is a lifeline at the current moment. We have used the unloaded brace for acute meniscal tears in some of our colleagues in the hospital. They have been back to work next week rather than taking four, six weeks off, so it has reduced their sickness time. And this may be the next way forward for acute meniscal tears. With the current pandemic, we are going to get longer waiting lists. Some patients and surgeons may be reluctant to uh, have and proceed with surgery. We are going to need clean hospitals. So this is where the non-operative treatment or conservative treatment of unicompartmental osteoarthritis uh, may be required. So conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you have to offer this brace uh, to patients with symptomatic unicompartmental knee OA. It may prolong the natural knee before an arthroplasty is needed. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'm just going to chip in quickly, um, just because um, uh, Mr. Chandratraya and Stacey uh, Copeland are just going to have a, a brief chat uh, about uh, her knee and her situation uh, with regards to her journey of what, what's gone on with her knee. Uh, just wanted to ask if there are any further questions for Mr. Chandratraya before we go on to that. The other thing to mention is that uh, Stacey's internet just, uh, in fact, her whole power just went from her whole house. So she is in at the moment, but we don't know for how long. So I'm just, just warning you of that. Um, so there was a question, uh, Mr. Chandratraya. Um, what are your thoughts uh, with regard to patellofemoral joint OA as well? What, what would your, your management be if that, that, that is, a, is part of the, the issue? So the way the unloader brace works, you can put in a, uh, so a patient has patellofemoral OA, a patellofemoral brace can fit inside the unloader brace to relieve that pain as well. And you're right, a lot of patients have both uh, symptoms and it's difficult to treat. But if you correct the varus or valgus, then it's a good chance that the pain in the patellofemoral joint may reduce. Okay. Um, and uh, Emily Pearson asked, um, she, she was just checking, did, did you initially say that, that you would tend to suggest that patients wear it for two weeks full time um, and then as needed after that? Is that, is that generally what you would suggest? Uh, no, it, the papers have suggested that patients use it for two weeks and because of poor compliance, they stop using it. Okay. So that's what, what has happened, but we have tried to get around that problem with good, you know, trying to make sure patients are compliant. Okay, brilliant. Um, so that's, that's most of the questions for now. Um, so what I'm going to do is just uh, pass over to, to you and Stacey, uh, Mr. Chandratraya, and then uh, just go through a, a few questions as we go through. Excellent. So, hi, Stacey. She's just muted at the moment. Hi. <laughs> hi, okay. Oh, great. Thanks for joining us on this webinar. Uh, so, okay, I'm staying by the window. I am not. Half an hour without power, so I'm hoping uh, this goes okay. Absolutely. Which knee is painful for you? My right knee. And how did it all start? Um, through many years of sport, I've been an athlete um, all of my life. I'm 38 now. Um, and met predominantly many years of football. Um, I had lots of you know different minor knee problems. And then the first sort of major surgery uh, kind of that I had to have was for a, a bucket handle tear of the meniscus. Um, it was round about 2005 when I was playing football in America okay. um, over there. So that, that was my first, that was quite a long recovery and that was my first major one. So Stacey, was it cut meniscus repaired or taken out at that stage? They, they stapled it, I believe. It was repaired yeah. Yeah. and they stapled it down and it was about a nine month, 10 month recovery uh, yeah. all told. Yeah. And then did you suffer from any further injury then to the knee? I did. Uh, I've had two arthroscopies since then. Um, a number of cortisone injections, uh, plasma treatment. Um, I've had it drained, um, orthotics, uh, you know, Everything. you name it, I've, I've tried it. <laughs> so be before you use the unloader brace, what was your situation regarding sports activities and, and painkillers that you were taking? Well, I don't take painkillers because uh, as an athlete, I'm a, a little afraid to yeah. take something I shouldn't. So I 
generally avoid them altogether. Um, and I try and use ice and compression and so on uh, for the pain. But uh, prior to getting the brace, which, which was around September, October, I'd had a meniscus tear in January last year, 2019. Uh, the initial of the treatment was a cortisone injection, which unfortunately didn't work. So then we had to wait 12 weeks um, for the surgery because you can't have um, surgery within 12 weeks of a cortisone. Um, so we had that in the May of 2019. Um, it was relatively okay afterwards. You know, I did get back to boxing, um, but then I had a, a quite a major flare-up in my first sparring session back last August uh, where the swelling was significant. I couldn't walk. Um, and then that was when I had to have the knee drained. And that was when my doctor talked to me about um, uh, a brace and he suggested uh, Osser and I got in touch. And, um, and then I, I had that fitted in September. So you're, you're one of those patients whom in our clinic will say, uh, stop your activities and take up darts, but you, you won't do that, will you? He actually said to me, there is, there is a, because I, I, I obviously, I, you know, I wanted to get a, a world title after the Commonwealth title. And my doctor said, you know, there's, there's other things, there's life after sport, there's things like golf. Yeah. And I just gave him one look and I think he knew that wasn't the route that I was interested in. So once the brace was fitted, how has your activities changed? Means you've got arthritis in the knee, so those symptoms will not go away, obviously. But, but just yeah, I've got quite uh, yeah, I've got quite advanced uh, osteoarthritis uh, uh, strain, which I've had the X-ray uh, quite a lot now um, because I've no cartilage really on the lateral side, bone on bone. That's what all the scans show. So it's, it's it is quite damaged. Um, the the Brace though enabled me to uh, get back to full sparring, like you know, multiple rounds of box rather than fight, obviously. Um, to do pad sessions, to do use the prowler again. I don't do squats anymore. I don't do lunges. I don't run because uh, that would just be counterproductive. But it did allow me to do, uh, you know, cycle. I can cycle in it. And also, um, I think what's important for me is that outside of my life as an athlete. Uh, being active is hugely important to me and when me and my, my boyfriend go on holiday we like to be active well I do and he kind of gets dragged along but when we go sort of we went to the Alps last year and I was able to you know go walking and it's always the downhill that's really tough for me and painful and the brace not only made it possible to do the walk but to not be in loads and loads of pain during and after the walk so it's actually made a massive difference to my life in sport but also in terms of uh, having a healthy lifestyle and active lifestyle, which is really important to me. Stacey, some patients complain of some giving way. So when you have little, so did you have that before and did the brace, like you did you feel the knee was unstable? Um, I didn't feel like it was unstable, not after the surgery. Um, but what I did have was, um, obviously it's, I'm a right leg, I'm a right-handed boxer. So that's the leg that I pivot off, that I push off, that I lay back on. Um, and so I, I use that, you know, that leg a lot and, and especially I put a lot of pressure on the outside of that leg because of my stance in boxing and the way that I fight. So um, it was quite a heavy emphasis on the outside of my leg and what would happen when I was on the bag or doing pads or anything like that is that I would get a, a tweak, like that, that really sharp sickening pain that you get uh, with meniscus problems and likewise I could get that just bending down to tie a shoelace or pick something up off the floor and do everyday activities. I could get that searing pain at uh, the brace um, the, pretty much eliminated that I didn't have that issue uh, with the brace enough that I could, you know, as I say, you know, fully spar. And the first couple, it was definitely on my mind. But after the first couple, I didn't even think about my knee whilst I was uh, sparring. So that, that's quite important. If you don't get any uh, touch with any further injuries, do you think you'll carry on wearing the brace? Absolutely. I've, I've tried a couple of different ones and we've also got a, a, a soft brace now because um, the likelihood is I wouldn't be able to fight in the one that I've got because it's got some hard attachments yeah. and the boxing board can be strict with those kind of things. So there is a soft version uh, with none of the sort of hard fittings and that's been equally uh, brilliant. And, and it's just, um, yeah, I, I mean, I've had, I've had eight surgeries over the years and 12 broken bones. So I've, you know, I've had my fair share of injuries as a lot of athletes have in contact sports. And, 
you know, surgery is not pleasant. I had one that went wrong in 2016 and had a severe chemical burn afterwards. So um, surgery is something that I absolutely will avoid if possible. Um, and as I've got older, they've been harder to recover from, uh, certainly in this knee where there's already a lot of damage. So, um, I, you know, honestly, the, the brace has made uh, an absolutely huge difference to my life. And as I say, I must emphasise, not just as an athlete, as you know, an everyday person who likes going on holiday and hiking and biking and walking and sightseeing and all of that, it's made a huge, huge difference to my life. And so I'm just very, very grateful to uh, particularly Maxine, the clinician I saw at Osso, but everybody for making uh, you know, such a massive difference to me, my sporting goals and my life. Thank you. Oh, excellent. Uh, we know you've got significant arthritis in one compartment and you may or may not need an osteotomy. If we say tomorrow, do you need an osteotomy, which is one year rehab, et cetera, and a brace, given your current commitments, do you think as a patient, you do have a choice to say, yes, I'll try the brace now? If I wasn't already using the brace? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think like, as you've quite rightly pointed out, it, you know, everybody's circumstances are so different. And for some people, they just can't stop working. Um, you know, it's, there's a lot of other, you know, major problems that will manifest if they were to take, you know, even three months off. Um, and that's when you've got access to rehab and you're able to do it. And you've got that mindset as an athlete does to do that rehab and be consistent with it. Not everybody does. So, you know, I absolutely think it's a, a you know, a brilliant option for people. Uh, for me personally, as, as you pointed out, it may be something that I have to have done, but that'll be, you know, my last resort and something that I'll do with the, you know, the doctor who I'm with at the minute, who I really trust and he's the doctor that suggested I, I get the, you know, the brace in the first place. So, um, yeah, I think it depends on your circumstances, but 100% I would recommend also, and, you know, obviously I've only used this product, but it's made a massive difference to me. So, I would 100% recommend it to other people, and I, and I do, because a lot of people, they're just not aware that this is available uh, and what a difference it can make. So, you know, I'm really keen to get that message out as much as possible because it, it can alleviate so many of the health problems and mental health problems that occur from, you know, people who I feel desperately sorry for who see somebody and they just say, you've just got to stop. And that's the only option they give them. And that leads to loads of other problems, as we know. So anything I can do, you know, to let people know this is available, uh, to, you know, to help it have a positive impact on their life, I absolutely will. Uh, last question for me, Stacey. Lots of uh, patients or doctors feel that the use of a brace will lead to muscle wasting. What has been your experience? Um, well, that's not been my experience, but then I have, uh, alongside um, the, the brace, I've, I've taken a number of other measures as well. So, the power's come back on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> really excited that the power's just come back on. You can eat. It's brilliant. Anyway, um, yeah, uh, for me, I've also, uh, alongside it in a strength and conditioning program um, with a physio who, um, again, you have to get the right person because there's a lot of things that, I, that are detrimental to me now, like squats. Um, so he's put a program together for me where it's lower impact. Uh, you know, it doesn't have the negative impact and, and, you know, a whole program of stuff that I can do to keep my muscles firing, keep them strong. Uh, and that's absolutely something that I would, you know, recommend for other people to do as well. Whether patients do that depends on how focused they are, what their goals are and how committed they are to it, of course. But for me, that's worked really well. And it's something I've done alongside of it and will continue to do even after I retire from competitive sport because I want to be active and well for us forever. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, that's nice for your life story. Uh, Giles, any questions uh, on the, from the delegates? Um, so there's just, just uh, one question with regards to the, you mentioned the 2014 uh, guidelines. Uh, apparently there may have been an update very recently. Um, are, you, are you aware of that? And if, if, is it any mention of, uh, or different uh, mention of the of use of bracing in that as far as you know? Uh, that's a very good uh, point. And I will have go back and have a look at those guidelines tonight. Yeah. I, I agree. I was the same, but uh, they've asked it a couple of times, so I thought it was good to to mention. But but yes. <laughs> um,
And um, Joe Lees is just asking, um, with people with medial pain following a total knee replacement, um, could you consider using it for that type of thing? Certainly it's very unusual, um, but do you have any, any experience of, of use um, alongside arthroplasty or potentially with patients? No, because that you need a problem will be some joint laxity. So it could be a ligamentous issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've not used that uh, in my experience, not used it. We have used it post tibial plateau fractures uh, mm -hmm. so after a few couple of weeks and when the swelling has settled down, we've used it, but not for arthroplasty. Right. Okay. Um, and you mentioned about the use in Sonk as well. Um, how, how long uh, would you, has your experience have been, been using that for? Um, I know you said it was quite a, a niche, niche patient group, but... Um, Myself and my colleague at Vision, they've been using for about four years now. We've mm -hmm. got four or five patients only. And it's too early to give any uh, you know, conclusions from just a small number of patients. Okay. All right. Um, so thank you very much uh, to both Stacey and uh, Mr. Chandratraya. Um, thankfully, Stacey's internet managed to survive uh, through all that. So uh, that's quite a relief because she did actually disappear for about five or ten minutes of Mr. Chandratraya's talk. So we were panicking slightly in the background. Um, so what we're going to do um, is we're just going to talk you briefly through the brace. Um, and then we're just going to show you, first of all, unboxing it um, and then putting it on, on a leg. Um, so there will be a, an element of PPE involved in this. So there will be a, a small interlude in a minute when I've got to put that on. I'm just going to go over to the table cam first of all and just show you the brace. Um, any questions that you have, do put them through the Q&A and we'll come back to those at the end. Um, so just going over here um, and then we're just going to um, show you the brace itself. So this is exactly as it comes uh, out of the, the box. Um, so I'm just going to open this up, take the brace out, place that one down there. And then we have a few other things that are just included uh, inside the box. So um, first of all, um, two bits of, of instructions. So first of all, we have the clinician's instructions or the instructions for use. We also have a patient user guide. Um, so this is more to go through with the patient how to apply the brace, the care instructions and how uh, to actually look after the brace. We then also have um, the break-in procedure. So um, this is basically some guidance for them as to how you would wear the brace in slowly, gradually build up the time you wear it, and also how to remove it. Um, in a similar way that Stacy was worried about her electrics, we've got quite a lot of thunder here. So if it does disappear, uh, it could be a power issue with us. Um, so we then also have the, the washing bag. So um, if you're going to wash the brace with the unloader 1X, uh, when you're actually coming to wash it, all you need to do is place the whole brace itself inside the washing bag, seal that back up and you can see that the washing instructions are actually on the bag there. So very simple uh, procedure and the whole thing can go inside the washing machine uh, there like that. So that's included in the kit. So uh, in terms of the brace itself, there's lots of different features on here. Um, and from a biomechanical point of view, it's exactly the same as the, the braces used in Mr. Chandratraya's uh, study. Um, but there've been lots of changes within Loader 1X. This has been out uh, for about 11 months now. Um, but one of the key things is you can see that there are various different yellow features on these braces. So uh, on the buckles, uh, on the hinge, at the BOA dials and then also on the smart dosing dials and basically anything that is yellow on the brace is a touch point for the patient to interact with so um, you can literally say to the patient the, the yellow areas are the ones that you need to uh, to adjust or, or, or uh, attach um, there's also different color coding so that you can actually apply the brace correctly so if you look blue on blue and then yellow on yellow there in order to apply it the other thing that's very important, and I'll go through this with the fitting in a moment, but if you look, there's an OSA logo here, and this is a very important uh, landmark in order that you can actually orientate and correctly position the brace, making sure that you've got it at the correct height. We also have these smart dosing dials, and these basically allow the patient to adjust the level of uh, dosing, so effectively increase or decrease how much unloading force the brace applies. 
Okay, um, there's also a number of accessories uh, on this side, so I've bashed a few of those uh, as, as I was going through. Um, but we have alternative liner for a patient with a particularly fleshy thigh, for example. Alternative liner for the calf if, if patients require something that, that isn't the standard Sensil version um, or the, the standard doe skin here. It's also an extra calf strap if the patient's got any suspension difficulties. And then these two uh, are actually to do with dexterity. So if the patient has any dexterity issues, um, um, they can actually uh, swap uh, to those and it makes it much easier for them to apply. So I've gone through the brace and what I'll now do is just go, go over to actually fitting the brace. So um, we're going to pass over to Stuart and you're going to hear a little bit of rustling as I actually put my uh, PPE on. So yeah, as Giles uh, puts on his apron uh, and his face mask, I'm also uh, gloved up and I know you can't see my face, but I do have a mask on. Um, so we'll go through a fitting um, and then we'll use dynamic cam to walk through it. Um, just so you know, the Under One X has been out now for um, within the NHS since January of this year. Uh, the Under One Smart Dosing is still available. Um, and if you need any personalised training uh, at all, because obviously we are, we're not able to, to come out to hospitals and, and conduct training, uh, please do feel free to get in contact with us uh, and we can run personal training sessions one-to-one -one, uh, on a similar format where we can be interactive with yourself. Um, so at this point, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Giles, who's, who's beautifully dressed. <laughs> so yeah, he's, he's sweeping mind or something. Um, so sound is a little affected uh, by the PPE, so please excuse that. Um, there is, as I mentioned, thunder in the background, so great timing. <laughs> so uh, when we actually come to fitting, um, one of the things that we're doing, first of all, uh, undoing the two buckles, um, and then it's important that we orientate the patient correctly. So what we actually need to do is get Stuart to just shift a little bit further further forward and we want the leg just slightly off full extension there like that. Now we also have this other camera that Pete's just uh, swapped over to here um, and this is really good for just showing how we orientate the, the brace itself. Um, so what's really important is that we make sure that this logo here is orientated so that we're level uh, with the top of the patella. So you can see that we've lined those two up here. The other thing that's extremely important is that we make sure that the anterior section of the hinge is at the midline. So you want to prevent the sort of situation where the brace is too far forward or equally it's too far back like that. So we want to make sure level with the top of the patella and the front of the hinge, this section here is level uh, with the midline, okay? The next thing that we would do is bring this uh, strap round and you can see this is uh, indicated blue um, and blue on the frame here. So we're then flipping round and clicking that into position. Um, and then what we're then doing is there's actually a calf strap on this side. All of them have crocodile Velcro sections just to make sure that they're adjusted in position. I'll come back to the calf strap in a minute, but it's really important that this is going up and over the calf muscle bulk. Um, so we don't want this to be sat low um, uh, at the equator of the, the, the gastroc. We want it to be sat above, really making sure that we gain good purchase and keep that in position there like that. Okay, next thing that we're doing is we're actually bringing this strap round and you can see that we've got yellow here and yellow here, passing that in and then clipping that into position here like that. And then another adjustment on this side. Now, with regards to tension of the strapping, it's important that we have the calf strap a little tighter than we perhaps have the thigh strap um, because we're really making sure that we've got good contact with the sensor liner that we have here. And we're making sure that everything's staying in position. So don't, uh, don't sort of uh, tighten up the thigh strap too much because it really is the bottom strap is the one that very much anchors uh, the brace in position. Okay, um, so what we now need to do is actually tension the straps, um, the dynamic force straps, so these two here. So slightly different from the original smart dosing one, this is actually done from the front. So very easy, we can actually just um, adjust this and shift that into position. And what we want with the leg in a degree of flexion is to place that in position. You'll notice I haven't yet trimmed the strap. And we're just placing it into the jaws of the uh, smart dosing uh, sort of crocodile Velcro section and I'm folding this back. So this is a really good neat way of you adjusting the straps without having to trim it. So it just means you can get that sized correctly and adjusted before you actually go into trimming any of the straps. So we're just going to ask Stuart to bend his knee. Okay. And then I'm just going to adjust these. So 
I'm going to go across the other way, but can you see that we're aiming to get this uh, let in that central section, that circle there uh, on that window of the smart dosing dial? And then exactly the same on the top, you can see, get it in the correct position. We've got that uh, position correctly. And now we now want Stuart to straighten his leg. Okay, and we'll just check the tension on this strap. So in this case, can you see the bottom one? We've just about got that tension correct. Um, so we can just about get a finger underneath that strap. And on the top one, um, we do perhaps need to go a little bit tighter. So if you bend your knee again, Stuart, and I'm gonna go a touch tighter on here and then straighten again. And you can see that I can just about get my finger underneath there. Now with strap tension, it's obviously quite subjective. So with certain patients, you may uh, actually find uh, if, for example, they've got poor skin condition um, or poor muscle bulk, you may not necessarily have it as tight as we perhaps would have with Stuart here. He's got good muscle bulk, he's got good skin condition. So you can obviously adjust your, your, your strap tensioning accordingly. But because the brace is dynamic, the tension increases in those straps uh, when we're actually in full extension because that's when the, the the main area that's affected by the osteoarthritis is in contact so just be aware of that whenever you're checking the tension of these straps always do it in full extension okay so we're going to get Stuart to have a bit of a stand and then have a bit of a wander um, so you can see He's uh, walking up and down there, and you can just illustrate actually that the, the tension reduces actually as he actually goes into higher degrees of flexion. So effectively, the unloader uh, is designed to apply that pressure from 20 to 25 degrees of flexion to full extension in line with where the osteoarthritic wear is within the joint. And you'll notice at the back of the, the brace, we've got this calf uh, strap just looping up and over the calf here. So we haven't got it. I'm going to push it down into the wrong position, but we've got it, haven't got it in that position. We're making sure it's looping up and over here like that. And also you'll see this popliteal pad is positioned right at the crossover between these two DFS straps. So if you need to adjust that, it's a case of placing your finger in between there, and then we can actually shift it side to side if we need to. So I'm not gonna do that for now, just because it's in the, in the correct position. So we're, we're then good to go, okay? Um, and effectively, um, that's, that's how we would fit the brace. The last thing that we need to do is just trim the strap. So I'll just do that now briefly. Um, and what we're actually going to do is just loosen these off. Now, what I didn't mention is just as I, I tensioned that, that one was perhaps a little bit loose. So it was actually over uh, in that position there. So if you can see, so what I need to do is I need to increase the tension on that strap by that corresponding distance. So I'll show you exactly how I do that. So we shift it out so that we can gain access uh, to the, the strap itself. And I'm gonna increase the tension by that amount uh, on that side. Um, and I will then trim that in position, have my handy scissors here, trim that. And then place that into position. So you can see crocodile Velcro just in there, fasten that into position and we can then tighten that up to that central position there. Exactly the same with the bottom one. Now this one, actually the, the strap tension was correct. I was happy with that one. So that's existing uh, and that central position. So I undo it. So it gives me access to the crocodile Velcro there. And I can just keep hold of where that strap is and then gently trim that along there. And then place that one back into position. So we just open up, in effect, the jaws of that Velcro and then tighten that one into position. And you can see nice low profile fit. We've got everything in position and we've just adjusted uh, that, that strap there. So have a stand again for me, Stuart. Okay, so a good, nice fitting brace. I'm just gonna shift this up here. I think actually it's the shorts that we chose to gave you a little bit, little bit long. Um, so I'll just adjust that on there. But you can see very quickly, very simply, we've got a really good uh, fit for the patient. We've got the hinge lined up. Uh, as I mentioned, that, that OSA logo on the, on the medial side is lined up level uh, with the patella and then halfway between the front and the back of the knee uh, is positioned on the anterior of the hinge. 
Okay, um, so um, are there any, uh, we'll just check if there are any further questions uh, with regards to the, the fitting of the, bra of the brace, or if there's any further questions uh, for Mr. Chandratraya, um, or indeed for Stacey. Excuse me, I'm just taking off my PPE and using some alcohol hand gel. Um, so, um, let's just have a quick look through. Just catching up with some of these some of these questions. Um, so there's a question from Amy Williams: Is there an anti-migration uh, strap, uh, and can we demo it? it demo it, yeah. Um, so I'll just go through that uh, one moment now. So if we just pop over to the table cam, and if you could take that brace off, Stuart. Um, so with the anti-migration uh, strap, what we actually do is we actually add a pad to the, to the uh, brace itself. So what we're doing is this is the, the, the standard brace that we've just fitted on Stuart here. Um, and you can see that the bottom section of the DFS strap is, is blue here. This is the gastroc strap. The top section of the DFS and the thigh strap has yellow stitching on here. And um, what we do is there's a Sensil uh, calf pad, has two pieces of Velcro, and this can actually be added onto the, the, the strap there like that, so that when we fasten this round and this becomes the, the strap on the back of the calf, it just means that you've got extra purchase because you've actually got that, that gastroc strap uh, and an increased uh, amount uh, of sensor silicon uh, passing all the way around there, okay? Um, so, um, 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 and there's just a question uh, from Rahul with regard to, to the older version of the unloader. Um, no, when we, it's just whether we're going to, um, to, to phase that one out. There's no current plans to, uh, to phase out the, the smart dosing version. It's important that you have different options to suit uh, your, your patient group. So that will continue to be uh, available. Um, there's also uh, a few questions about sizing. Um, didn't mention that originally. So um, basically from a sizing perspective, we're taking a measurement 15 centimeters below mid patella. You then have the hinge on the affected compartment. So in Stuart's case, um, he would have had a, a right medial uh, on that side. We do have lateral versions as well. Um, so it just means that you can, you can order accordingly. So we have sizes all the way from extra small up to triple uh, XL, I think. Um, and there are also different options. If you've got a patient with a particularly fleshy thigh, um, you can actually add a, a different uh, thigh liner on there. Okay, um, so I think those are probably most of the most of the questions uh, for now. Um, if you have any any further questions, do feel free to, uh, to to send those through to us, and we'll endeavour to to answer those at the end. Um, just remains for me to to thank Mr. Chandratraya uh, for his fantastic uh, talk. Um, so I'm just going to pop over to to him there. You know, thanks very much. I hope it was an enjoyable and please stay safe wherever you are. I hope to see you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's really appreciated. Uh, and Stacey, a little bit, little bit fraught at your end, but you, you got through. <laughs> I can't tell you how happy I am that we've got the electrics back on. I'm very, very happy. Um, there was a question by Fiona, if it's okay for me just to answer that one. Yeah. Uh, she's asked if it can be worn over leggings which uh, I can answer, yes, it absolutely can. So I've actually got a few videos on my social media uh, wearing the Ossa brace. If, if any of you want to see it being worn for numerous activities, boxing, I've even done a yoga headstand in it, you know, all sorts of things, um, then you can find them on my social media. Um, and yes, I've, I've worn it over leggings um, and it's been really comfortable. It doesn't slip. Um, it's been absolutely fine. I've done sort of high impact stuff. So, you know, jumping around, boxing, cycling, all sorts with it, you know, with shorts, but also with it on leggings. So I know a lot of people prefer to wear leggings to training and I found it absolutely fine. So the answer would be yes, uh, it's been fine for me to wear over leggings. Absolutely.
Yeah, that's great. I mean, it's, it's not uh, generally we'd recommend it's fitted against the skin, but we're obviously we're aware that lots of people will want to wear it. Um, it's not going to affect the functionality of the brace. Um, something that can happen is it depends on what layer you put it over. Uh, so in some instances, you might struggle with the, the brace slipping, but obviously Stacy hasn't had uh, that as an issue. It's one of the limitations of any knee brace. Anchoring it in position is really important. That's why we've got those different options for the, the gastroc strap, for example, uh, making sure it just stays in position so so really important um okay so thank you very much really appreciate you joining us um the, the last thing really uh is just to mention that, that next week uh we have uh, a talk uh, from Ollie Chilcott um, with regards to um, uh, bracing uh, of spinal fractures. Um, so he'll be joining us uh, from uh, University Hospitals in Coventry. Um, so uh, look forward to that. And I believe that there'll be a link uh, to this webinar put at the end. Um, so please do join us next week. Um, thank you very much to our speakers and uh, we will hope to see you next week.